It was upon retiring to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day that I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep came not near my couch as I struggled to reason off the nervousness which had dominion over me. I endeavored to believe that much, if not all, of what I felt was due to the phantasmagoric influence of the gloomy furniture of the room, of the dark and tattered draperies which, tortured into motion by the breath of a rising tempest, swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls and rustled uneasily about the decorations of the bed. But my efforts were fruitless. An irrepressible tremor gradually pervaded my frame, and at length there sat upon my very heart an incubus of utterly causeless alarm. Shaking this off with a gasp and a struggle, I uplifted myself upon the pillows, and peering earnestly within the intense darkness of the chamber, hearkened to certain low and indefinite sounds which came through the pauses of the storm. Overpowered by an intense sentiment of horror, unaccountable yet unendurable, I threw on my clothes with haste and endeavored to arouse myself from the pitiable condition into which I had fallen by pacing rapidly to and fro throughout the apartment. I had taken but few turns in this manner when a light step on an adjoining staircase arrested my attention. I presently recognized it as that of Usher. In an instant afterward, he rapped with a gentle touch at my door and entered bearing a lamp. His countenance was cadaverously wan, but moreover there was a species of mad hilarity in his eyes, and evidently restrained hysteria in his whole demeanor. And you have not seen it? He said abruptly, after having stared about him for some moments in silence. You have not then seen it? But stay! You shall... Thus speaking, he hurried to one of the casements and threw it freely open to the storm. The impetuous fury of the entering gust nearly lifted us from our feet. It was indeed a tempestuous yet sternly beautiful night, and one wildly singular in its terror and beauty. A whirlwind had apparently collected its force in our vicinity, for there were frequent and violent alterations in the direction of the wind, and the exceeding density of the clouds did not prevent our perceiving the lifelike velocity from which they flew. Yet we had no glimpse of the moon or stars. But the undersurfaces of the huge masses of agitated vapor were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and distinctly visible gaseous exhalation which hung about and enshrouded the mansion. You must not, you shall not behold this, said I shudderingly to Usher as I led him from the window to a seat. These appearances which bewilder you are merely electrical phenomena, not uncommon. Let us close this casement. The air is chilling and dangerous to your frame. I will read and you shall listen. And so we will pass away this terrible night together. The antique volume which I had taken up was The Mad Tryst of Sir Launcelot Canning. It was the only book immediately at hand, and I indulged a vague hope that the excitement which now agitated the hypochondriac might find relief even in the extremeness of the folly which I should read. I had arrived at that well-known portion of the story where Ethelred, the hero of the tryst, having sought in vain for peaceable admission into the dwelling of the hermit, proceeds to make good an entrance by force. Here, it will be remembered, the words of the narrative run thus. And Ethelred, who was by nature of a doughty heart, and who now was mighty withal on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken, we did no longer to hold parley with the hermit, who in sooth was of an obstinate and maliceful turn. But feeling the rain upon his shoulders, and fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his mace outright, and with blows made quickly room in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand. And now pulling therewith sturdily, he so cracked and ripped and tore all asunder, that the noise of the dry and hollow-sounding wood all arroomed and reverberated throughout the forest. At the termination of this sentence I started, and for a moment paused, for it appeared to me that from some very remote portion of the mansion there came indistinctly to my ears what might have been the echo of the very cracking and ripping sound which Sir Launcelot had so particularly described. It was beyond doubt the coincidence alone which had arrested my attention, 
for amid the rattling of the sashes of the casements and the ordinary commingled noises of the still increasing storm, the sound in itself had nothing which should have interested or disturbed me. I continued the story. But the good champion Ethelred, now entering within the door, was sore enraged and amazed to perceive no signal of the maliceful hermit. But, in the stead thereof, a dragon of scaly and prodigious demeanor, and of a fiery tongue, which sate in God before a palace of gold with a floor of silver. And upon the wall there hung a shield of shining brass with this legend and written, Who entereth herein a conqueror hath been, who slayeth the dragon, the shield he shall win. And Ethelred uplifted his mace, and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him, and gave up his pesty breath, with a shriek so horrid and harsh, and withal so piercing, that Ethelred had feigned to close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, the like thereof was never before heard. Here again I paused abruptly, and now with a feeling of wild amazement, for there could be no doubt whatever that I did actually hear a low but harsh, protracted, and most unusual screaming or grating sound, the exact counterpart of what my fancy had already conjured up for the dragon's unnatural shriek as described by the romancer. Oppressed upon the occurrence of the second and most extraordinary coincidence, by a thousand conflicting sensations, in which wonder and extreme terror were predominant. I still retain sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting the sensitive nervousness of my companion. I was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question. From a position fronting my own, he had gradually brought round his chair so as to sit with his face to the door of the chamber, and thus I could but partially perceive his features. I resumed the narrative of Sir Launcelot, which thus proceeded. And now the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, bethinking himself of the brazen shield, and of the breaking up of the enchantment which was upon it, removed the carcass from out of the way before him, and approached valorously over the silver pavement of the castle to where the shield was upon the wall which in sooth tarried not for his full coming, but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty great and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these syllables passed my lips than I became aware of a distinct, hollow, metallic and clangorous yet apparently muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leapt to my feet, but the measured rocking movement of Usher was undisturbed. I rushed to the chair in which he sat, his eyes were bent fixedly before him, and throughout his whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity. But as I placed my hand upon his shoulder, a sickly smile quivered about his lips, and I saw that he spoke in a low, hurried and gibbering murmur as if unconscious of my presence. Bending closely over him, I at length drank in the hideous import of his words. Not hear it? Yes, I hear it, and have heard it. Long, long, long. Many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not that my senses were acute? I tell you now that I heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago. Yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred. The breaking of the hermit's door, and the death cry of the dragon, and the clangor of the shield, say rather, the rending of her coffin, and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison, and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footsteps on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman! Here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables. Madman! I tell you that she now stands without the door! As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance there had been found the potency of a spell, the huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant ponderous and ebony jaws. Without those doors there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. 
for a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. Then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother. And in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse, and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full setting and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through the once barely discernible fissures of which I have before spoken as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous, shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters, and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher.